I'll try and set the scene if I can and just give you a little bit of a peek under the tent and what we've been trying to do the last couple of years. Because we've got a business that's, we like to call it 62 years young, but we were showing sort of some dangerous signs of aging. So there's a few things we, we, we've undertaken and I'm not gonna do a laundry list of the, the kind of the business stuff, but more just talk about almost the, the mentality, the, the, the kind of cultural approach we've tried to take to get the business like ours moving. So hopefully that'll uh, create some, some interesting and dynamic Q&As as, as, we, as we get going. So I always start, I start internally in, our, in, in a lot of our discussions the very same way which is what's driving this kind of a, a restless energy I have, a, an, an urgency I have to try and uh, evolve our business the way we are. And I'll put it this way, and then, then I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I look at it this way. If this very same group was sat here five years ago, and any one of us happened to be stood here, and we were to say, who would guess in five years' time that the largest taxi company in the world does not own a single car and does not employ a single driver? You'd have kind of shaken your head and think they've had too much of a liquid lunch. Or that the largest department store in the world doesn't have a single storefront. Or that the largest provider of overnight accommodation does not own a single hotel, doesn't own a single room, doesn't actually own a single bed. That's Airbnb. Or that the largest provider or show, show of films does not own a single movie theater or cinema, doesn't have a single screen, Netflix. And the reason I say this is, is not because technology is disrupting the world, which clearly it is, but why is it relevant to a business like ours, which is these were really traditional industries getting disrupted. This wasn't the creation of new industries. It was technology disrupting it. You know, the, the bricks and mortar of the hotel industry, the bricks and mortar of department stores, the tradition of the taxi companies. So in, in amongst that somewhere was, I thought, a warning signal that we are in a very traditional business. And you might as well expect it to get disrupted and there's a really good chance that this technology will be part of the disrupting mechanism. So the attitude was, do you wait to get disrupted or you, do you try and become the disruptor within the industry and, and lead that and anticipate it and move before you get caught? So that's part of some, some of the, you know, like the, the, the mental approach that, uh, that we've taken to, to what we have ahead of us. So again, we can talk about this world now, which is just one which is, entirely, and you will all see this in your businesses, of all the varying and, and the, the great diversity of businesses represented here today, is hyper-connected. It's a one-touch society. Everything is one swipe away. There's more information available than ever. There's more stakeholder groups than you can possibly imagine. And that brings heightened expectations of all of us and of all, everyone in business. And so that whole disruptive and the speed of the disruption is um, something that we all need to embrace and we need to work out how we can best embrace that and, and bring that to our businesses without losing the heritage and the values and the core of what you, what you actually stand for and what really matters. So again, the very simple way, and hopefully this will come across as we just chat with each other, I always try and bring everything back to as simple a description as you possibly can. Is that, probably gives you the best chance of being understood, certainly with an organization like ours. Which is, this isn't about being a different McDonald's, it's just being about a better McDonald's. A business that's more modern, has this restless energy to keep innovating in a way that our, our history, we have a rich history, has, has always done. So yeah, we really did try and gain confidence from our past and our heritage but actually not rely on it. And perhaps we've just been relying on our past for a little too long. And uh, the reality is the world outside of McDonald's was changing quicker than the world inside McDonald's. And that's never a great equation for any business. And, uh, and we, we were getting caught. So we wanted to rely on those, those fundamental strengths and, uh, and say the heritage, the brand assets that we have. But then how can we better and more meaningfully communicate in ways to customers that they care about they take notice of. And 
when we do make a positive change in our dollars, it can be incredibly rewarding because, and this is not about, I'm not trying to impress with the scale of the stats, but it's more, again, the mindset behind it. If we serve around 27 million people a day in the US, if you're a little bit better tomorrow than you were today, a lot of people notice quite quickly. And if you're even better the next week, more people notice it very quickly. If you make meaningful change in and around the restaurants, your ability for the customer perception to recognize that the business on the move is that much greater. So, um, and we, again, we can draw upon our successes in the past to give us the confidence that we can continue to do that in the future. So, I was just gonna come up with a couple of examples of what I mean by that. When we introduce certain food, or certain technology, or certain concepts, it can often become ubiquitous through society as well. And whilst nowadays, I don't think people would, McDonald's wouldn't come to the top of people's list as being one of the most innovative companies in the world. Probably not today, because there's a lot of other fast moving, very challenging, very uh, progressive businesses out there, particularly in technology. But think about when we first developed and launched the drive-through. So we're talking 45 plus years ago. That was incredibly innovative because restaurants at best were drive to There wasn't much of an eating out culture anyway. But the idea of recognizing that car ownership was something that was becoming more um, available to the average families and then adapting an operation that was only set up to manufacture and do car hops and deliver and sort but to then wrap a drive through lane around it and still trying to level all the sorts of things you're trying to do. It was incredibly innovative and of course that has now transgressed all sorts of industries from libraries to pharmacies to dry cleaners and the rest. I'll give you one other example, again, which I always think is interesting to reflect on because, again, it becomes so matter-of-fact in the current day that you don't think back to someone somewhere made some really brave decisions and, and, and has established um, society, societal change. We were certainly one of the first, I'm not claiming to be the first, but certainly at scale, to make eating out at breakfast a very regular thing because typically everyone would always have breakfast at home, restaurants would open mid-late morning, and there would be a traditional, that would be the day part. But then people's working patterns start to change over life, uh, over time, and travel changes, and people's mode of travel changes, and people's desire to get into work or avoid the tra changes, and therefore you end up creating an entirely new culture and an entirely new way that people can eat and consume, if you like, in, in that day part. So I think we've just got these interesting decisions. That was not an easy decision, because you then really go from a, a, a business that runs on two shifts a day to three shifts a day. It starts slow. It's a totally different supply chain. There's more complication on the operations, and it's not profitable in the early days. Whereas now here in the US, it's more than 20% of our business, so it's a substantial part of our overall, uh, overall business mix. We can do stuff with supply chain, which um, I think is a responsibility that comes with a, a lead, and, and size and scale has to be used for good, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, you know, an, a, again, a nice recent example was um, our US team last year made the commitment that we would shift the two billion eggs that we buy every year in the US to cage free. Now that is not sufficient production for two billion cage free eggs in the US because the industry hasn't been set up that way. But we said that's the commitment and we are going to be a true customer to that commitment and if it takes 10 years it takes 10 years but we're going to start here 1%, 2%, we're going to get to 100% within 10 years. And what happens is the egg industry then sits up and takes notice. And we've been told by the Humane Society that the three weeks subsequent to our announcement, 140 other national chains also made their commitment, which then means the egg producing industry further theirs acceleration. And, and that's a kind of a nice example of using size and scale for good that I think is also very important for a business like ours. It's responsibility we have.